about new terminology as we move on through your study of English intonation. The topic today is tonicity and the nucleus. We're going to talk about what a nucleus is and indeed what tonicity is. And then we're going to have a look at a few rules, possible rules for locating the nucleus in an international phrase. After that, we'll quickly review what we've said and then hopefully there will still be time for putting it into practice so that you can actually have some hands on experience of locating the nucleus. So we're going to start with what is a nucleus, and this means revising, I think, what Michael has already told you about the international phrase structure. What we can see from the diagram that's showing on the screen at the moment is that the nucleus is at the heart of every international phrase. It's almost the definition of the international phrase. If I say, hmm, that's an international phrase, and that hmm, Single sound, single N sound, is the nucleus. International phrases, if you read books, are sometimes called other things. They may be called a word group, an intonation group. There are lots of terms, but it all refers to the same basic chunk of speech. The other components in an IP fit round the nucleus, always in the same order. We never change the running order of the prehead, the head, the nucleus at the heart and the tail. So the optional bits, the tree head, the head and the tail, I put in brackets. Michael also talked to you about syllables and there are several different types of syllable. We have, for example, full and strong or strong syllables. Um, these are ones with big vowels, vowels like R, A, Ah. And they're different from weak syllables. Weak syllables have weak vowels, like the happy vowel, or weak u, or schwa, even uh. These strong syllables can be stressed, or they may be unstressed. And taking the vowel R, we can see that we've got it stressed in the item cardigan, but it's unstressed. In the second item there, vanguard. The stresses can be accented or unaccented. And an accented stress is one that has pitch prominence. Probably you remember that if Michael's mentioned it. Pitch prominence is a syllable that is much higher or lower in pitch than things that have preceded it, um, or has a moving pitch on it. And all syllables like that are said to be accented. The nucleus, the heart of the international phrase, is um, an accent. Indeed, it's going to turn out to be the last accent in the whole IP. And if there are other accents, it follows from that, but they will precede the nucleus. So our accented syllables, our special stressed syllables, our nuclear or pre-nuclear. And you can see there, I've identified two accents in, I'm wearing my cardigan. Well, you a full face lie, because I'm not, but anyway. I'm wearing my cardigan has got two accents in it. Whoops, sorry, pressed the wrong way. <coughs> accents focus attention. They're a kind of gambit on the part of the speaker to make sure that you concentrate on what they're saying to you. The nucleus, as I said, is the last accented syllable in the international phrase. And there, just to remind you about the running order in the phrase, there's the nucleus in the middle, and any other accents are going to come in this pre-nuclear stretch here. This means that everything after the nucleus is unaccented, or we say out of focus. Follows from that that because the tail follows the nucleus, the words in the tail, in an international phrase, are not terribly important for the message. So if you miss what somebody said in the tail, you probably will still understand what they want you to hear. You just miss a little bit of detail, which is 
probably redundant. So, so much for what a nucleus is. What is tonicity? How does it connect to this? Well, the nucleus is sometimes called the tonic syllable. And as soon as you see tonic syllable, you can see where tonicity comes from. And tonicity is our understanding of whereabouts in the international phrase the nucleus or tonic syllable falls, whereabouts the speaker puts it. The problem with the nucleus in English is that it doesn't have a fixed position. It ranges about. It can come at the very end of the group. It can indeed come at the very beginning of the group. Or it can come somewhere in the middle. So we don't know whereabouts in the word group, the international phrase, the international group. We don't know whereabouts in that bit of speech the nucleus is going to fall. We have to listen for it. The different positions, of course, impact on meaning. They impact on the message that the speaker is putting across. So the different positions that the nucleus occupies have different effects on the meaning of the message. <coughs> we can have tonicity of different kinds. We can have what we have here. In, she's buying a pound of potatoes. Don't worry, you're still not on your handout yet. I will tell you when you get to your handout. Buying a pound of potatoes. And what we've got here, you can see that the nucleus here, and we always underline the nucleus. I've actually made it bold as well, so it really stands out for you. But that's the nucleus. She's buying a pound of potatoes. It's right near towards the end of the international phrase. It's on the stress syllable of that last important word there. And that's what we call end focus or broad focus. And that's said to be, other things being equal, it's said to be the unmarked position for the nucleus. So it's unmarked tonicity. I don't know whether you're familiar with these two words, marked versus unmarked, but linguistics uses them all the time. And unmarked is the normal, everyday, commonplace, whether it's particular word or a particular word order, or here, the location of the nucleus. But marked is something that is unusual and stands out and catches your attention. So, she's buying a pound of potatoes, unmarked tonicity, a completely unremarkable utterance. Compared with, she's buying a pound of potatoes. You can see the nucleus has moved back a little bit. She's buying a pound of potatoes. Notice how the tail has become very unfocused there. She's buying a pound of potatoes. Maybe you can't even hear it anymore. She's buying a pound of potatoes. And what I've got there is increasingly marked tonicity. And I have what we call early focus or narrow focus. And you can see how, in a sense, I have narrowed down what you have to listen to. If I put a line through that, we've really narrowed down what you've got to pay attention to. And the implication is that none of this is important. So, why isn't it important? What we've got here is buying a pound of potatoes in response to the question, what's Janet doing? Buying a pound of potatoes. Now, what's Janet doing? She might be washing her hair. She might be riding her bicycle. She might be getting ready for bed. There's all sorts of things she could be doing. Um, so it figures that all the information is important. You don't know, that's why you've asked me. Buying a pound of potatoes. All the information is new information. I have got my nucleus here, which gives me um, end focus again. I can't leave anything out. If I leave something out, the message is not going to be fully understood. So the nucleus here is on the stress syllable of this last important word, which we call a content word. And content words, a little bit more grammatical terminology, are the nouns, the main verbs, the adjectives, the adverbs, the big words that have proper definitions in the dictionary. So 
So remember, nucleus up towards the end, you've got end or broad focus. And that's unmarked. But if I change the question, if I have, how many potatoes is she buying? A pound of potatoes. A pound of potatoes. I've moved the nucleus forward. And what I've got now is a situation where potatoes, you can see, is the old, shared, given information. Why? Because I just said it when I asked the question. How many potatoes did she buy? So both people know that the topic is potatoes, so it's shared information. A pound. I could leave out the potatoes altogether, or I could replace it just with the a pound. A pound. So the tail's very irrelevant there. What I've got now then is early or narrow focus, and you will remember from the earlier example how that works. The nucleus has moved away from the end and is now sort of in the middle of my phrase. Well, actually, it's near the beginning of my phrase in this particular example. Is she peeing a pound of potatoes? Uh, buying a pound of potatoes. Buying. I could again just say, buy it. Buy it. She's not peeling them. And this time, it's not just potatoes that shared, uh, but a pound of potatoes is all the old information. Why? Because it's already been mentioned. It's out there. Shared information. Again, another example of early or narrow focus. And this one's right at the very beginning of my international phrase. Now, we might want to know how we do it. And this is where your hand up kicks in with the examples. So all my examples from now on will be in your hand up. I suppose you could call what I'm going to say next rules for locating the nucleus. It's very difficult to do it by rule. It's nothing sort of really substitutes for experience because there are so many different aspects to rules that we can't really consciously hold all of those in our mind and say, oh yes, I'm going to apply rule number 13 when I answer this question. It doesn't work like that. But we can make some generalizations. So, the first little rule for pragmatically determining the location. Now, what I mean here is um, you're in control. It's the message you want to go across. It's the message that's appropriate in a particular context, and context is significant here. So, when all the information is new, as we've seen in the examples we've been looking at, the nucleus tends to fall on the last content word. What do you do at the weekend? We're going on a trip to Stonehenge. Now, what you can see there is that we have end or broad focus. And what you're doing at the weekend, the second thing listens to the whole question, if they jumped in and started answering after what are you doing, they might say, well, you can see I'm still writing my essay. No, no, not now, at the weekend. So you have to keep listening to the nucleus. And the native speaker is unlikely to jump in inappropriately because psychologically they know the nucleus hasn't happened. So what are you doing at the weekend? We're going on a trip to Stonehenge. In both cases, the speakers are keeping the listener listening right to the end by having end or broad focus in terms of the tonicity. Now, it could be that the last content word has new information, even though something else is old or shared. So if I said to you, are you looking forward to the journey? The answer might be, well, I don't like journeys with such an early start. Now, that doesn't match exactly example two. We'll come back to that. I think I've got trick or tricks in your handout. Think journeys for trips at the moment, all right? 
I don't like journalists and such. Now, journeys is obviously shared. Oh, given information, because the first speaker just used it. But because the early start bit is the important part of this message, and because it's structured um, at the end, we have to have broad focus if you're going to keep listening. I don't like journeys with such an early start. A third one, though, when that last content word is shared, is old or given information, then the nucleus starts moving back through the international phrase to find something <coughs> new. Sorry, what's all that about early starts? I was saying I don't like early starts. I could just as well say I was saying I don't like. So you can see it's moved away from that end position, moved away from early starts onto my liking or disliking. Okay, who wants to make an early start? I want to make an early start. I want to make an early start. It's come right to the front to identify me, the speaker. And in fact, I could just as well say in response to, okay, who wants to make an early start? Me. That's enough, isn't it? And I want to make an early start is, is again, focusing on me, the speaker. So the nucleus is moving back to find something new because everything at the end is shared. It's already in the public domain. You and I both know all about that. The words have been spoken. Now sometimes it's not a question of pragmatics so much as a question of semantics. The position of the nucleus is actually triggered by the meaning of the word. For example, when an English speaker repeats themselves, literally uses the same word again, the nucleus will move to a new or different word. Now, that doesn't happen in all languages, but it does happen in English. You can't focus twice in quick succession on the same thing. So, in example Sark 5, I see Sarah's driving a new sports car. What we've got there is end focus. Why? It's a new topic of conversation. All the information is new. And we've got to keep waiting until we get to that key bit of the message, the sports cars. Then, the response comes back, what make a sports car? We just say, what make so a sports car? The tail, completely irrelevant for the message. But I don't actually know the names of makes of sports cars. Names of them, okay. Tail, longer now, so all shared information. It was a red car. It's a red car. So there is Sarah in her new red sports car. Okay? And you can see how the nucleus has moved around, moving back, finding something new, finding the new bit of the message so that you, the listener, come along with what I want you to understand, what I want you to share with me as the speaker. I think basically, you know, it's a bit manipulative, all this tonicity thing. I'm telling you what to understand, whether you like it or not, simply by where I'm putting the nucleus. So that's repeated items. We don't repeat the same word twice. We don't focus on it twice. We might, we might say it twice, but we don't focus on it twice. Um, the same is true of synonyms. So if you have a synonym, you're in exactly the same situation. Synonym, something that means the same as something else. Are you cycling there? Yes, I enjoy going by bike. So to go by bike is the same as to cycle. It's a synonym. So we're not going to focus on it. We're going to focus on something new. I usually travel by tube. Because I hate so the underground, tube, the same thing. I still haven't met the new girl in the office. Oh, I already know Mary. So we know that Mary is a synonym for the new girl in the office. Somebody else says, oh, I already know the troublemaker. So we now know something about Mary as well. Perhaps we don't want to meet her after all. 
Um, and that was uh, the problem with trips and journeys. It, uh, I can remember the slide number. Yeah, this one, example two. In your, um, in your handout, we've actually got synonyms there. We've got trips instead of journeys. So it figures that we wouldn't put the nucleus on that particular item. Here I've used identical items, but in your handout you have synonyms. All right. So each response that we've just looked at has earlier or more narrow focus again, moving away <coughs> from the synonym, the old information, to find something new. It's a bit complicated now. If you've got a word with a broader meaning that's used to include a previously used word, so for example, um, uh, a blackbird, right, is a particular type of Bird. So bird has a broad meaning, whereas blackbird, starling, thrush, chaffinch has a much narrower meaning. It comes in that great big pool of birds. Okay. Example nine. What about raspberry and mango? We obviously know that we're talking about fruit smoothies here. I like most sorts of fruit smoothie. So fruit smoothie is the big term and raspberry and mango is the particular one that I'm choosing off the menu. Should we give her roses? She likes all flowers. So we know a rose is a flower, we need to focus on something else and <coughs> we're focusing on all flowers. It doesn't matter whether it's roses, daffodils, petunias, whatever. <coughs> Do you like ravioli? I eat just about any Ravioli is a type of pasta. So, if you've got a word with a broader meaning, don't focus on it because you're effectively repeating yourself. Okay? Again, we can see examples of increasingly narrow focus. Fine tuning, looking for something new, moving away, as it says here, from the generic term. It includes the already mentioned <coughs> specific token. Go the other way though. Supposing now you're going from um, a, a, a general term like dog to a specific type of dog, a spaniel, an Alsatian, a poodle, whatever. Could you like a fruit smoothie? Now if I just say yes, that would be lovely. You could buy me anything. You might buy me a banana one, and I might hate bananas. So I've got to focus on the more narrow term. Yes, I'll have raspberry and mango, thank you. So I've now focused in on my raspberry and mango type again. Shall we give her a bunch of flowers? General. Yes, specifically. Let's get roses. So I've narrowed it down. So I'm now keeping end focus because I'm highlighting the new information, the narrower term. Let's have pasta. I like ravioli. So you can see, can't you, I've turned it round the other way now. Something has gone from the more general to the more particular, and I must focus on the more particular. So now I've gone back to end focus, broad focus, and again, I'm pointing out something specific and new, and the listener has to wait for me. Sometimes grammar triggers where we put it. Affirmations and denials, so agreeing, disagreeing with things. Song 15, Jonathan can't play the piano. Can play it? Play the piano? He can. And I'm focusing here, affirming his ability to play it on the auxiliary verb. Dominic doesn't speak any Polish. He does. Speak some Polish. All right. So if you're actually affirming something, and obviously contradicting somebody else, you put it on the auxiliary verb. We do that quite routinely without thinking twice. You don't have to think. Gosh, yes, you know, um, first grammatical rule, as in example 16, 
the conversation would have moved on by miles. So this is what I mean by you need experience, you need practice. All of this needs to become second nature as it is with the native speaker of the language. The other way around, denying somebody, it goes on the negative particle. Mum can play the trumpet. She can't play the trumpet. She can't. And can't obviously has got the negative contracted into it, so the oot bit is the not bit that's attracting the nucleus there. I think you're going to be late. I'm not going to be late. I'm not. And again, it goes on the negative particle. Um, vocatives and a positives. Now, there's a grand word. Vocatives, you probably know. That's when you talk to somebody by name. As in, um, I might say, um, hello, Brian. And I'm referring to Brian by name, who obligingly waved back to demonstrate the effectiveness of that. Now, hello, Brian. Brian's not really very important there. The important thing is the greeting. <laughs> okay? Brian and I both know that he's called Brian. It's shared information, so there's no point in my saying, hello, Brian. <laughs> that would distinguish him from Nina, who's sitting next door. And it would be very unusual. We tend not to put the nucleus on the vocative using somebody's name. So, have you met the new student? You've been put? In this example, I'm actually talking to somebody called Yubinka. Have you met the new student, Yubinka? Can you help me, Alex? Here, this poor guy down the pit in his wheelchair is actually asking somebody called Alex for help. So, using the name as a vocative. And you can see in both cases, here's the nucleus, there's the vocative. Here's the nucleus. There's the property. The property is in the tail, it's not important. So that works provided we both know what we're called, provided we both know everybody's names. Now, in the case of an A positive, I am using another way of referring to the same person. So I could say Brian, the lecturer. Brian, the teacher. Brian, the chap in the front row. And I am putting two nuclei to that, um, but I'm putting a nucleus on the A positive. So compare what we've just had. Have you been the new student? You've been cut. With, have you been the new student? You've been cut. And the new student and new binker are both referring to exactly the same person. The first nucleus, um, for those of you who are feeling really sophisticated, you could dispense with it here. You could say, have you met the new student, new binker? And we know that it's that particular new student that I want because the nucleus is on the name. All right? What we don't know course, is the answer to that question. We've no idea who I'm talking to. Am I talking to Klaus? Am I talking to Ben? Am I, you know, talking to Bronwyn? We don't know. Can you help me, Alex? That was example 20A. And now, can you help me, Alex? It's no good going and helping her. She's all right. It's me, Alex, that wants the help. Okay. Can you help me, Alex? So as soon as you focus on the name, it becomes an A positive, another way of referring to um, the same person. Empty categories. Now these are these are categories where people fall down. Join Alex at the bottom of the pit. Um, empty categories, special words which look as if they're going to be content words, look as if they're going to be big and important, but in fact <coughs> aren't. And these empty categories are deaccented and go in the tail. I want. Now, I might be saying, I want a sandwich. I want a coffee. I want a sports car. I want. One there is an empty category. Come around to my place. Come around to my place. Now, I'm not telling you where I live. I could live in a penthouse. I could live in a cardboard box or a tent, but I'm inviting you there. 
non-specific feature. My place. So place, like one, is an empty category. It's a dreadful thing. It's a dreadful matter. A dreadful affair. A dreadful business. And the nucleus always comes on dreadful, not because it's so bad, but because thing, matter, affair, business, completely non-specific. They are full empty categories. And the one thing English doesn't do is it doesn't focus on those. If I say I want one, I'm saying don't give me two, three, four, five. I just want one of them. That becomes the number one. But here, I want one. Empty category. Right. So much for rules and regulations. We've looked during the course of this morning at um, revisited accent and stress. And we have seen that um, the last accented syllable in the international phrase is the nucleus. And that's usually a content word, a lexical item, like nouns, verbs, etc. The opposite of those are form words, and those are things like the, and, looked, etc. Small things. Pronouns. We rarely focus on pronouns. They're all form words, grammatical items. Whereabouts the nucleus falls in the international phrase is the domain of tonicity. Just to remind you about international phrase. This is popping up in um, alphabetical order, I notice. And we talked about broad or narrow focus, which is often triggered by the type of information that's being put across, whether it's given, old, shared information, or whether it's something new that I want you to understand. Now, it's a good idea to see how much you can remember. And you've got a text at the end of your handout, which is this one. And we're going to start working on this text. Don't read the answers, but we're going to start working on this text and trying to apply what we've learned, trying to identify the international phrases and their nucleus. So the first thing to do when you're confronted with a text like this, I always think, is get rid of the punctuation, because the punctuation can be quite distracting. Sometimes it helps, but it can be distracting. So let's get rid of the punctuation. Let's recast the whole thing without punctuation. Now, the first job. We want to know how many international phrases there are in that first term, the first utterance. One. Excellent. So we identify that by putting an international phrase boundary at the end. And it's the end of a turn. It's obviously I can stop there. So I put a major boundary. I put a double line. Sometimes if I'm going to go on, I use a minor boundary, which is just a single line. We'll see one of those. But there we go. So we've identified that. So the next job is to decide which syllables are stressed. How are we going to say this international phrase rhythmically? Where's the first stress? Put, yes. Bag, table, vowel. Okay? I put this bag on the table, vowel. Yeah, four stresses. Excellent. There are the four stresses. Next job. Which one of those stresses is the nucleus? Table, yes. Why isn't it foul? It's a positive. Bravo. Yes, 100% improvement on last year's group. Because last year's group, at least one person wanted to put it on vowel. Um, and then had to remember that poor old vowel is evocative. So we don't even need to mention the name at all. So the nucleus will go on the first syllable of table, the stressed syllable of table. And there it is. We need to carry this forward a little bit further. And we need to do the same thing for the second speaker. So we're going to decide how many international phrases there are and put in the boundaries. See if you agree with your neighbour, and then you can tell me once you've negotiated the number of phrases, you can tell me how many there are. Think there are three, yeah? How many other people think there are three? 
There's consensus. That's very good. Yes. I think we're at three as well. Where's the first one end? After Peter, that's right. And the second one ends after way. And the third one obviously ends after shopping. So let's look and see. Yes. And they are all major boundaries because they are all points at which I could stop and the other person could come back into the conversation. Certainly, Peter. Oh, thanks, Peter might say. Or certainly, Peter, move those books out of the way. Right, Peter might say. But in fact, Peter's not saying anything, so I get another bit of a turn as well. Okay, but they're all potential um, ends of term. Now, we need to decide about stresses. How many stresses in that first international phrase there? Definitely one, yes. Remember, stress is not nuclei. Anybody have an urge to inflate that? I would have two, I think. Because I would have one on certainly and another one on pizza. But you could have certain, certain with just one. But I think you'll find that the version that I've used, so we might as well think about the two possibilities, not just certain, but certainly pizza. I've gone a bit more slowly. Because that's one of the things that stress does, of course. It puts the brakes on. It stops you from rushing ahead and collapsing everything and weakening everything. Um, maybe speaking less distinctly. It's very good, I think, to get stress right in, in a language if you're not a native speaker of the language because it gives you these kind of landing places to keep the articulations in order. It's certainly, Peter. Yes, I've got two stresses. Now, which one of those is the nucleus? That's the next thing to remember. Yeah, that's right, because that reminds you, just in case you fell into that trap, that Peter is the, the vocative again. So we're going to underline the first syllable. Now that's the other thing that's important here. Look, this word, where's my arrow on? This word table has two syllables. This word certainly has three syllables. But the nucleus is just one syllable. So I'm only underlining the stressed syllable in each case. There's the stress. There's the stress, and there is the underlining, and it stops at the end of the syllable. So it's not the whole word, it's a single syllable that's the nucleus. And continue the second IP, stresses and nucleus, please. Yes, stresses, somebody's going to move, yes. Those books. Wait, yeah, so we've definitely got three stresses. And um, which one of those do you think is going to be the nucleus? Listen, people are voting for way. It would be move those books out of the way. Now that's an interesting one, and it's partly to do with the nature of this adverbial phrase at the end. It would be understood that we'd already talked about books if we did that. And we haven't here. We have no information here that suggests we've already talked about books. So I think you'll find that the unmarked form actually has slightly earlier focus. And end position adverbials often do that. They repel the nucleus. The nucleus goes back to the phrase that they're sort of modifying. I could just say, move those books. Move those books. I just happen to be a bit... I don't know, verbal, and have added in and out of the way, which isn't really necessary. Move the books is enough, isn't it? So I think what we'll find is that, in fact, it fronts to books. I wouldn't say out of the way was absolutely wrong. You'd be perfectly understood. But we don't have context here to motivate putting it on way. And that's something that you will find sometimes, that there are little bits and pieces where you think, oh, now what is actually going on here? This is a bit odd, because I would have thought that we would have end focus. And often it's things like the grammatical status of the phrase in question. Um, that's what I've also meant by, you know, too many rules. Um, we can't remember all of that, not consciously. So you wouldn't be 100% wrong, but you'd be, say, 35% wrong if you put it as a first bet on the way. And then the next one, the final phrase in this turn. 
Yes, have, we'll probably have a stress and shocking, we'll probably have a stress, excellent. And which one of those stresses is my nucleus? Shocking. shocking, because it's all new information. I've now changed the topic of conversation, um, probably promoted by the idea of these bags that the person wants to put down. And let's do one last one. Let's have a look at the next turn. How many phrases? Yeah, we have two. You could get away with one. You could say, yes, I've been walking around all day. You could do that, but I don't think that's what I've done. I've, I've, as it were, taken my own advice and I've slowed it down a bit. I've put the brakes on by adding in an additional stress here. Yes, that's right. So the first bound we are yes, and then obviously the next phrase, the statement, is a whole IP in itself. So stresses in these two IPs. Well, the first one, it goes without saying, doesn't it? Um, as we said, it's only got one syllable here. And in my example, my earlier example, hmm, I only have one segment, never mind just one syllable. I've just got a voiced bilabial nasal, haven't I? Hmm. Okay. Um, but it still has to have a stress because it's still the heart of the intonational phrase. It is the nucleus, and you have to peg the tune on it. And I need that stress in order to hang on the tune. It's almost like a kind of coach peg. The stresses are things mm. on which we hang the parts of the tunes. So, oh, I've given the answer away, look. <laughs> I've been walking around all day. I knew I had to make a mistake before we got to 12 o'clock. I always do. Um, so there is one. The first one is a nucleus. We can't help it. Where's the nucleus in the second one? Day, that's right. So that's one where it is going to come right at the end. Walking around the bit. Now, the next job, of course, mm -hmm. is to do the rest, mm -hmm. the homework. Yes. So, thank you very much. Now you've got most of that in your handout. You can take it away, digest it at your leisure. I'm back tomorrow, but is there any single quick question that somebody can't go away without asking? Okay, so if you want to ask questions, just catch it on your way past. Thank you very much.